You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. What is it you want, Barry? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! I see dead people. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Filmmaking Conversations with Damien Swayde is part of the critical conversations currently taking place across the film community. The podcast reaches out to the next generation of filmmakers who continue to look for inspiration and guidance. Remember to hit the subscribe button and leave a comment in the comments section. Share the podcast with friends and family, and have a great day. And now, over to the host of the show, Damien Swaby. Sophie, how are you today? I'm good, thank you, Damien. Enjoying this great British summer. But thank you so much for coming on, Sophie. I, I really appreciate it. You know, after watching all of your work, well, some of your work, not all of it, and listening to some of it on NPR, I really thought you'd be great to talk to. So before we get into it all, please do tell us, how did you get your start in the industry and what is it exactly that you do? Right. So I am a reporter and a producer working in a variety of mediums. Um, And I've actually done digital, I've done newspapers, I've done TV and and I've done radio. So a bit of a jack of all trades when it comes to storytelling. Um, At the moment, the last few years, I've been primarily working in audio, so radio and podcasts, um, but also um, making short films and videos as well. Um, So I I found with journalism that often the more you can do in terms of the mediums in which you can tell your stories, actually, um, that can be really beneficial for getting it out there on a number of platforms. Um, so for the last few years, I've been working for the BBC here in London. And um, most of my relationship with the BBC World Service, which is, uh, if you don't know it, it's their global radio station that broadcasts in um, oh, some, more than 100 countries around the world. And um, that's led to an opportunity to work for NPR, which is National Public Radio in America and to work with their correspondent here in London on telling stories all about the UK and Ireland for those American audiences and also uh, working on some podcast work stuff for them as well, which has been great. That does sound great. Sounds like you're keeping very, very busy. I try my best. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's peaks and troughs, I guess, in this industry, but, um, there's a lot of stories to be told at the moment, which is the good thing. Uh, I mean, of course, I think the industry is facing a lot of challenges, like many, with um, with COVID. But one thing's certain is that there's m- more stories than ever to be told, I think. And I think one of the first things you may have done, I could be completely wrong, is a video, a Vox Pop Pops video about Valentine's Day. <laughs> Yeah, well, that was when I was um, actually at journalism school. So, um, yeah, I mean, you you asked me how I got my start and it it goes back before journalism school because I think I have really wanted to to tell stories for as long as I can remember. Um, You know, it was something that I was very into as a little girl, you know, writing newsletters and, like, sending them out to all my relatives. Um, Oh, great. (laughs) um but um but yeah I mean after it was it's sort of in my early 20s that I started to to realize that um I I wanted to to work in media and tell people stories and um I I did I did that in a variety of ways I mean my my other great love has been um foreign languages and I realized that that was something that I love doing expressing myself in uh, in in Spanish first of all, which was um, what I what I had learned at university, uh, and also French. And then I started to put those put those things together and um, and start to do some some storytelling. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, <laughs> the Valentine's Day video. Yeah, I mean, we were we were at journalism school and they just said, go out in the university building and, um, you know, make a film and, and w- on whatever you want. And so, um, yeah, we, we asked people how they felt about Valentine's Day, which is just one of those things which gets a massive variety of responses from those people who uh, who love the romance and those who think it's just an icky, commercial, unnecessary piece of nonsense. So when you do a video like that, did you get any responses that you felt were out of this world or did you get any that you thought were a bit off-putting? And how easy is it to produce and edit a video such as that? Well, I mean, you get some bad responses. I think anybody who's tried Vox Popping will know that um, you have to ask a range of people and not every answer is going to be interesting or entertaining. And they don't have to be groundbreaking for a a Vox Pop, really. You're just trying to get a snapshot of opinions. Um, But certainly if somebody has nothing to say, you're probably going to leave that on the cutting room floor. Um, So, yeah, we definitely got some of those. But I think, um, I mean, the... The main thing is just to be quite enthusiastic with the members of the public. And you know, it, it takes a bit of confidence because you're going up to strangers and, um, you know, you have to have um, you have to be brave and just grab people in the street or um, strangers walking around and just say, hey, can I can I grab you? And what do you think of this? And just be quite, quite bubbly and ballsy about it. Definitely have to be bubbly and and ballsy about it. That's for sure. So when you went to. I can't remember the sorry the the nation in Africa, Diane Barr's football academy. Yeah, that was in Senegal. That's it. Yes. How did that video uh, take place? How did you get involved with that? And was that a, a long time after your training and education in journalism? No, it wasn't too long after. I mean, I um, I actually put off going to to journalism school or or, you know getting that formal training until I was it wasn't until I was about um, 26 that I did that Um, and for me that was just because it took a bit of time to kind of figure out what it was that I wanted to invest in and I think um, you know after doing a university really I was just keen to get into the world of work and I thought you know I don't need to I don't need to go to to journalism school like let's just do it and so I did that for a while and you know I recommend to anyone just getting stuck in and and there's so many different paths into things that you know for a formal training isn't always the necessary way um but after after making some of my own stuff for a while um I felt that it would give me that extra boost that would just allow me to get a job in some of the companies that I really admired and um, it's perhaps an unfortunate truth that it is it is for a lot of people necessary to make that um, that investment and commitment because it is a difficult you know financial outlay as well but um, I think certainly it does it does allow you um, to kind of access companies that are very competitive these days um, so going back to your question, um, it was, yeah, I'd done a variety of stuff before, before my journalism, um, masters, but after it, I started working for CNN here in London. They've got quite a big bureau in London and I was working, um, mainly doing digital stuff for them. I was writing and producing some videos, um, and I did some work for the sport desk. Uh, which was quite funny for me because, I mean, I'd not. It wasn't like I was, you know, particularly sporty or anything. But I like I liked football. I had um, an appreciation for for football and um, particularly Liverpool. <laughs> oh, you must be happy. Yeah, it's been a, a long time coming and very well deserved for Liverpool. So yeah, although it was a strange circumstance in which we won the league this year, um, I'm very content for them. Absolutely. Um, so, as I said before, I was um, f- French, and uh, French-speaking countries is one of my passions. 
and I really wanted to visit Africa and I thought where can I go uh, where I can speak the language and do some stories and Senegal popped out at me um, the, the, the official language is, is French although Wolof is kind of the, the more popular language there and um, it's a really interesting place I'd sort of read a lot about it and I was really excited to to see what it was to see what it was all about and so I decided to gather together some ideas for stories that would make a sort of month-long trip there worthwhile and I um I went to my editors at CNN and said no here, here's a variety of stories I'm going to go to Senegal um you know will you take these and um they were very happy to do so and uh, one of those stories was about a football academy in Senegal and it's the top football academy in the country and Senegalese love football it's um it's incredibly popular over there um and so it was actually Patrick Vieira the former former manager of Arsenal who got together with some other Senegalese players and um, a, a businessman and a, the head of the league over there and decided we want to make a football academy that will give young uh, boys here the opportunity to train um, for to, to become the best footballers that they they can try and be, but also alongside um, their football training to get an absolutely stellar education. And so they set up this uh, this academy, which is it's a high school. And it's a football academy and they it's a free school, completely free. And boys from all over the country, basically sort of through their grassroots football clubs, they will, if they're very talented, they kind of have the opportunity to go through a couple of trials. And um, the, the lucky the lucky gifted ones will be selected to go to this school and, and some of the the kids, well, most of the kids are, are from very poor backgrounds and um, what the school does is, is and they're very um, clear about their purpose, is to say we, uh, we want everybody here to get a great education and hopefully go to university and if they become pro football players, that's also great too, um, but it's, it's about building a, a generation of, um, of, of, of strong of strong Senegalese uh, players and and also uh, professionals, and so yeah, this was the this was the idea, and I um I went off and I, I didn't have um a, you know film film training, um so I, I made a decided to make a film using what I had, which was my iPhone, and um, had a little kit. Um, there's some great kits that you can you can get. Um, it just, you know, just had a little mini road uh, rappel mic, a lapel mic, and um, a, a little shotgun mic, and you know, a little light, and a couple of little mounts and tripods, and um, and that's what I used to make this video um, about the Football Academy. And when you say you had those um, those tools in your in your kit bag. Did you have more than one iPhone? Because sometimes people use their iPhone to record the audio and another iPhone to actually shoot the people in the documentary or film. iPhone filming has, I mean, the, the techniques and the ideas are so great now that, you know, I hadn't even kind of had a chance to investigate all of those. Like the whole thing came about quite spontaneously. So it was just the one iPhone. And, you know, now there's so many clever things that you can do to, to make really quite technically impressive films um, on iPhones that, you know, people wouldn't necessarily even know had been shot on iPhones. Um, and um, yeah, so it was just, it was just the one. And, you know, looking at the film now, it's, it was the first, the first film I ever have made and you know there's all sorts oh, well done. all sorts of things I would do differently Damien you know there's loads, <laughs> there's loads of mistakes in it but I think really um that didn't matter for for this project you know it's it's it was about the story and um you know I'm, I'm delighted that you found it and liked it what type of things did go wrong what mistakes did you make Oh, I mean, I think the most, the biggest is probably um, like the framing on um, 
I don't know, one of my interviews in the film, you know, it was, there was a lot to think about. So it was just, it was just me. And so I was, you know, doing, doing the actual filming through the iPhone, this really fiddly little kit, but also um, doing the interviewing, which was completely in French. Now, although um, my French is pretty good, I hadn't really had much experience doing interviews in um, a second language. And so when you're when you're thinking about the language and the questions and the answers and all the other technical stuff, like things fall through the cracks and that's just a matter of experience. But um, there's definitely um, something in the shot that was just very, really badly framed and it looked like it was coming out of the guy's head and <laughs> mistakes like that. But, um, and also, I mean, you... There's things as well with sort of, if, if you don't have great lights and you don't have a proper tripod, you're not going to be able to get it to look the best, are you? Um, but I think it's amazing what people can make with iPhones now. And, you know, in, in, um, in the lockdown, BBC journalists, BBC reporters have been making all sorts of TV packages and films on iPhones because they're, you know, they're not working with cameramen in the same way as they might traditionally. And with the iPhone, I'm guessing in an ideal world, you would always go to use a camcorder or a mirrorless camera or a DSLR. Can you see yourself picking an iPhone over one of those cameras? I mean, it really depends on the context and, uh, and what you're, and what you're doing it for. Um, no, I mean, I think you can always get uh, way better results with those cameras, but it's it's there in your toolkit. And if you are um, traveling around and you don't have much space and you're, let's say you're doing a radio piece and you're also writing an article, um, you know, you might not all, and it might just be one of you, then you wouldn't necessarily have the bandwidth to use the best camera possible so I think it's something there to have in your toolkit but absolutely uh, you know the, the better the camera the better the film and editing the film did you do that on your phone or did you have a laptop with you and how did you go about editing yeah I did that on the laptop um, sort of back in back in London um, I did that on Final Cut Pro so I, I, I didn't edit on iPhone and I've got to say that is pretty fiddly although people do yes. I don't know how people do it but I agree with you <laughs> yeah absolutely and I don't know how you can get the precision that you would need um but I mean yeah man I suppose if you're if you're putting something out super quickly on social media um it, it has its uses and the film itself how did you find out about this school this academy sorry I think with any idea, it's a case of just sort of reading around as much as you can. I mean, that one actually came up in discussion with my editor at CNN, and he was a great football lover. So he had actually said, hey, take a look at this. Um, so, you know, it was an idea that had um, been discussed as a team, really. But um, ideas come from all sorts of places. Sometimes they come from reading uh, websites which aren't just your your main news outlets and uh, the big magazines but maybe some maybe sometimes you go down a little rabbit hole of internet research and um, stumble across a niche website that has something that you hadn't heard about before and I always think if I haven't heard about it then that makes me you know that makes me intrigued and I want to know if if many other people have heard about it has this been covered widely um, and ideas also often come from conversations with friends, you know, maybe down the pub, like, what is it that people are talking about? What is it that they're interested about at the moment? And that can be quite a good steer for topic areas that perhaps could make stories. I see. Down the pub, some of the conversations are the best. Like, I can relate. <laughs> I certainly can. But when you do a project like this, access it looked like you got incredible access how did that come about everybody being so free and open with you yeah well they were um they were very welcoming and and happy to tell their story i mean that it it was a process of just 
collaborating and liaising, getting in touch um, in advance of the trip and saying, look, we would really like to, to tell your story. And I think they had had a French documentary crew in um, to make a, a documentary about uh, Diamba, which means warriors in French. And um, so they, they've done it before. And I think they did say, like, we, we don't want to you know, do loads of, have loads of press and, and some crew in all the time because these boys are getting their education. Um, but equally, in this case, I think they were they were pretty happy to have some interest from from CNN and and also I think it perhaps gives the um, gives the students um, a bit of a bit of aspiration and, and motivation and to know that people are so excited to see what they're doing. Um, but certainly, there's always that whenever you're approaching somebody whose story you want to tell. I always feel that that first email, it's normally an email, um, although it might be a phone call, but that first email, you know, is like probably the thing that is, you've got to word it so carefully, I think. It's something that I try and try and give as much uh, sensitive thought to as possible because you know that if you word it badly, you might just... Um, the door might just be closed from the get-go. And if you word it well, perhaps that will be the impetus for them to, to reply and get that going. What did they think when they saw the final video? What type of feedback did they give you? Or if you got any, I'm not even sure, sorry. Oh, well, I, they loved it. I mean, the, the video was at the top of um, a sort of long written article um, about the school and a variety of of interviews yeah so yeah they they told me they liked it which was which was very nice and you know it's, that's always nice as a as a journalist to um to hear that the people whose story it was enjoyed it because well that's that's important to me um very much good i can understand that another project i watched that you were involved with that i really liked was the former FARC rebels in Colombia. And I'm, I'm guessing that one may have been more of a collaborative experience. Can you tell us a bit about that project? For sure, yeah. So um, this was for the BBC World Service. And um, I pitched them an idea that I had seen, um, like what I was saying really about the rabbit hole of internet research sometimes. But um, I, I was... I was going to Colombia and I thought just googling and I and I came across the fact that since uh, the country had this historic 50-year conflict between um, the government and the left-wing FARC rebels and right-wing paramilitary groups so five decades of conflict over land rights um, drug wars and, and and so on and this came to an end uh, with a historic peace deal um, in 2016. Um, what followed was this unintended consequence that I had not ha heard about before, which was that all the areas of the rainforest and um, a, a, a large part of Colombia um, is taken up with Amazon rainforest. Uh, all those areas, which for years had been no-go areas because they were they were inhabited by by violent guerrilla rebels, um, they'd suddenly disbanded and that created a power vacuum that meant that these huge swathes of precious rainforest were no longer controlled by, by the guerrilla rebels and therefore they were seized upon by everybody who wanted to um, make some money by, by getting in on the rainforest. And... Um, I found that very interesting. So uh, this was the idea that I pitched and um, the World Service um, was obviously primarily radio, but they also put out a lot of videos as well. Um, they said, great, go and, go and do that. And so um, they assigned me uh, with a producer and also um, a cameraman who we met up with in Colombia um, to, to make a video and then to do a radio piece as well 
Um, so yeah, that was a, that was a collaborative effort and a, a really interesting experience. It sounds like it. And what, what you've got shot was very, very, very lovely. Some of the aerial shots I liked and, you know, it's not just about the shots, but those are the things that, that came to my mind. But when you are a part of a project like this and you're not behind the camera and you've got more of a team, how are you, how do you feel about that experience compared to being a self shooter? Is it a lot less stressful or at times is it even more stressful? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I really like working in a team. That's definitely my preference. I, I love the energy of it. I just like working with other people. Um, um, it can be quite a solitary um, job as a journalist, depending on the type of things you do. But it's, it's always more interesting for me to, to work with a team. And I think you always get way better results. I mean, how can you do everything yourself? Like it, something's got to give, really. So um, to have to have that team, I think, makes a way better product. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, it also comes with challenges. People have different different ways of doing things, um, and you, yeah, of course, you don't always get things your way. You've got to listen to other people's um, desires, how they want to do things, and sometimes um, perhaps the the story that you want to do maybe gets compromised because of logistics or timing, um, which is one challenge that we came up to uh, came up against with this with this trip in the rainforest. Um, we were going to have, I think, sort of three days for for the for the trip. Um, which isn't a lot, but bearing in mind this is uh, not a long film. Um, but um, what was going to be like a five-hour drive from from the airport into the forest was uh, was more like an eight-hour drive. So oh gosh, we've already lost one day of uh, the schedule. And then when we got there, um, so I was doing some some live hits for the BBC. Um, reporting this story on on a radio program that goes out live and it was scheduled for a particular day and then due to some other news priorities they said actually we want you to do it a day earlier so everything then got squeezed another 24 hours which um as you can imagine when you've sort of driven eight hours down a, a bumpy track into um to the edge of the amazon rainforest isn't isn't the easiest request to manage <laughs> There's um, there's obviously different reality. There's different priorities in the mix, and um, you know you've got to you've got to sort of take into account um, the different pressures. But absolutely, uh, working with a team is is by far um, the better way to do it, in my opinion, um, because you just you get to use the benefit of everybody's skills and experience, and also there's just I mean, there's so many things to do, especially with a drone and, um, you know, carrying everything and with the radio equipment as well. It just, it wouldn't have been possible. And out of all of your work that we've seen from you, what is your go-to piece? If you had to say to someone, this is what I do, watch this. It's been a, it's been a real journey for me of trying out different mediums. So it's lovely, um, it's lovely that I've produced things in, in video that I can show people, but also in radio and text. So at the moment, I'm still very much kind of um, using all of those three mediums in, in like, I suppose, how I define myself as, as a journalist. But um, increasingly, uh, yeah, I would like to, to make more films. So I would actually point to, to that project in Colombia because it, you know, it's a great example that, that shows both um, the video and the radio and, um, and also the type of stories that I really care about. I mean, I personally feel that climate change and the climate emergency is the big story of our time. And, um, you know, it's, it's not, not the only thing I'm interested in, but going forward, I think I'm, you know, I'm really motivated to find powerful stories about that 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 inspire people to care and inspire uh, governments and corporations to care and to make the policies needed to avert the, the worst case scenario so 
I'm really interested in stories about the environment and also, um, you know, n- not just the environment, but these stories about heart and stories about people. And the reason why I liked this um, this FARC story is we, we honed in on uh, former former members of the gorilla who are now using their knowledge and experience of living and working in the forest to track people who are illegally logging and report them to the authorities. And um, so any story that kind of cuts across a few interests is always, you know, you know that when you get that feeling of excitement that it's like, it's um, it's something that resonates emotionally, but it's also something you think is uh is important for for wider causes. I love what you just said there. I can see it in your work and I can feel the passion coming through my headphones from you um, about these stories. Good on you. I think there's there's so many, we're sort of often generalists as journalists, or certainly that's the experience I have so far. And, you know, just turning your hand to so many different stories. But every now and then you do get one where you just you know, you just feel so fired up about it. And I guess that's that's when you know that you've got to go after it. And what can we see from you in the future? Well, at the moment, um, I'm working on a podcast, which I'm really excited about. Um, so that is a, a podcast for NPR. Um, it's a podcast called Code Switch, which um, I don't know if you know it. No, sorry, I don't know this one. Not at all. Well, they've got a plethora of amazing podcasts and um this what Code Switch is conversations and stories all about race, um, and obviously, you know, in the, in these times, this is something that we're talking about more than ever, um, with good reason. And the story that we are making for this podcast is all about uh, what's been happening in Bristol with the toppling of the statue of the slave trader Edward Colston, um, which happened just over a month ago, um, in the aftermath of the horrific killing of George Floyd, which sent these earthquakes around the world. Um, In Bristol, that rippled over into a Black Lives Matter protest where the statue was toppled. And we have been following what's been happening since with this interesting situation where a, a modern and multicultural liberal city is grappling with the shameful past of um, its, its prominent place in the slave trade. And um, not everybody in the city is happy that the statue was toppled and that, you know, a, a black power statue was put up after it by, by a, a guerrilla artist. And um, so we're, we're really looking at how what happened in America rippled over here and and how the police handled these things so differently, you know, with, with the protests in America, um, there's tear gas, there's rubber bullets, there's been there's been so many arrests and so many injuries um, here. While, while while our police are far from perfect, the, the approach is incredibly different. So we're looking um, at that and um, and how the city moves forward and and what place statues have in in this in this in this mix of of how we actually solve structural inequalities um linked to race oh excellent and this podcast is up on npr now or will it be up soon it will be soon so we've just been going through hours of uh, hours of tape and um structuring it and, and editing it as we speak so i hope it will be up in a few weeks brilliant well, Sophie, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, Sunday evening, the day of rest and all. So it was lovely to speak to you. And we'll certainly speak soon. Oh, thank you, Damien. It was nice to speak to you. Thanks a lot. Take it easy.